Welcome to A Year of War and Peace. I'm your host, Brian E. Denton. A Year of War and Peace is a daily, year-long, chapter-by-chapter reading of and meditation on Leo Tolstoy's epic novel, War and Peace. In these videos and podcasts, you'll be treated to a free reading of one chapter per day of the novel, plus a reflective essay I've written individually tailored to that day's chapter. These readings are offered for free, though if you'd like to support me, you can do so in one of three ways. First, you could purchase my ebook, A Year of War and Peace. It features the entire novel, plus all of my reflective essays, and it's only $2.99 on Amazon.com. You could also become a patron at patreon.com slash Brian E. Denton. If you sign up there, you'll receive a sonnet once a month, plus a link to an ebook of my collected sonnets. Finally, if you like, you can make a one-time donation to my PayPal account. The email there is brianedenton at gmail.com. You can also use that email to contact me. I'd be happy to hear from you. Your support is greatly appreciated. Today's reading is of Chapter 47 of War and Peace, followed by a reflection on the same. Chapter 47 Prince Vasily was not a man who deliberately thought out his plans, still less did he think of injuring anyone for his own advantage. He was merely a man of the world who had got on and to whom getting on had become a habit. Schemes and devices for which he never rightly accounted to himself, but which formed the whole interest of his life, were constantly shaping themselves in his mind, arising from circumstances and persons he met. Of these plans, he had not merely one or two in his head, but dozens, some only beginning to form themselves, some approaching achievement, and some in course of disintegration. He did not, for instance, say to himself, This man now has influence, I must gain his confidence and friendship, and through him obtain a special grant. Nor did he say to himself, Pierre is a rich man. I must entice him to marry my daughter and lend me the 40,000 rubles I need. But when he came across a man of position, his instinct immediately told him that this man could be useful. And without any premeditation, Prince Vasily took the first opportunity to gain his confidence, flatter him, become an intimate with him, and finally make his request. He had Pierre at hand in Moscow and procured for him an appointment as gentleman of the bedchamber, which at that time conferred the status of counselor of state and insisted on the young man accompanying him to Petersburg and staying at his house. With apparent absent-mindedness, yet with unhesitating assurance that he was doing the right thing, Prince Vasily did everything to get Pierre to marry his daughter. Had he thought out his plans beforehand, he could not have been so natural and shown so much unaffected familiarity and intercourse with everybody, both above and below him in social standing. Something always drew him uh, toward those richer and more powerful than himself, and he had rare skill in seizing the most opportune moments for making use of people. Pierre, on unexpectedly becoming P Count Bazukov and a rich man, felt himself, after his recent loneliness and freedom from cares, so beset and preoccupied that only in bed was he able to be by himself. He had to sign papers to present himself at government offices, the purpose of which was not clear to him, to question his chief steward, to visit his estate near Moscow, and to receive many people who formerly did not even wish to know of his existence, but would now have been offended and grieved had he chosen not to see them. These different people, businessmen, relations, and acquaintances alike, were all disposed to treat the young heir in the most friendly and flattering manner. They were all evidently firmly convinced of Pierre's noble qualities. <laughs> he was always hearing such words as, with your remarkable kindness, or with your excellent heart, or you yourself so honorable, Count, or for he is clever as you, and so on, till he began sincerely to believe in his own acceptable kindness and extraordinary intelligence, the more so as in the depth of his heart it had always seemed to him that he really was very kind and very intelligent. <laughs> Even people who had formerly been spiteful towards him, and evidently unfriendly, now became gentle and affectionate. The angry eldest princess, with the long waist and hair plastered down like a doll's, had come into Pierre's room after the funeral. With drooping eyes and frequent blushes, she told him she was very sorry about their past misunderstanding, and did not now feel she had a right to ask him for anything, except only for permission, after the blow she had received, to remain for a few weeks longer in the house she so loved, and where she had sacrificed so much. She could not refrain from weeping at these words. Touched that this statuesque princess could so change, Pierre took her hand and begged her forgiveness, not knowing what for. From that day, the eldest princess quite changed toward Pierre and began knitting a striped scarf for him. Do this for my sake, mon cher. After all, 
She had to put up with such a great deal from the deceased, said Prince Vasily to him, handing him a deed to sign for the princess's benefit. Prince Vasily had come to the conclusion that it was necessary to throw this bone, a uh, bill for 30,000 rubles, to the poor princess, that it might not occur to her to speak of his share in the affair of the inlaid portfolio. Pierre signed the deed, and after that the princess grew still kinder. The younger sister also became affectionate to him, especially the youngest, the pretty one with the mole, who often made him feel confused by her smiles and her own confusion when meeting him. It seemed so natural to Pierre that everyone should like him, and it would have seemed so unnatural had anyone disliked him, that he could not but believe in the sincerity of those around him. Besides, he had no time to ask himself whether these people were sincere or not. He was always busy, and always felt in a state of mild and cheerful intoxication. He felt as though he were the center of some important and general movement, that something was constantly inspected of him, that if he did not do it, he would grieve and disappoint many people. But if he did this and that, all would be well. And he did what was demanded of him, but still that happy result always remained in the future. More than anyone else, Prince Vasily took possession of Pierre's affairs, and of Pierre himself in those early days. From the death of Count Bazukov, he did not let go of his hold of the lad. He had the air of a man oppressed by business, weary and suffering, who yet would not, for pity's sake, leave his helpless youth who, after all, was the son of his old friend and the possessor of such enormous wealth to the caprice of fate and the designs of rogues. During the days he spent in Moscow after the death of Count Bazukov, he would call Pierre, or go to him himself, and tell him what ought to be done in a tone of weariness and assurance, as if he were adding every time, You know I am overwhelmed with business, and it is purely out of charity that I trouble myself with you, and you also know quite well what I propose is the only thing possible. Well, my dear fellow, tomorrow we are off at last, said Prince Vasily one day, closing his eyes and fingering Pierre's elbow, speaking as if he were saying something which had long ago since been agreed upon, and could not now be altered. We start tomorrow. And I'm giving you a place in my carriage. I am very glad. All our important business here is now settled, and I ought to have been off long ago. Here is something I have received from the Chancellor. I asked him for you, and you have been entered into the diplomatic corps, and made a gentleman of the bedchamber. The diplomatic care career now lies open before you. Notwithstanding the tone of wearied assurance with which these words were pronounced, Pierre, who had so long been considering his career, wished to make some suggestion. But Prince Vasily interrupted him in a special deep, cooing tone, precluding the possibility of interrupting his speech, and he used in extreme cases when special persuasion was needed. My, mon cher, I did this for my own sake, to satisfy my conscience, and there is nothing to thank me for. No one has ever yet complained yet of being too much loved, and besides, you are free. You could throw it up tomorrow. But you will see everything for yourself when you get to Petersburg. It is high time for you to get away from these terrible recollections. Prince Vasily sighed. Yes, yes, my boy. In my valet will go in your carriage. Ah, I was nearly forgetting, he added. You know, mon cher, your father and I had some accounts to settle, so I have received what was due from the Rizan estate, and will keep it. You won't require it. We'll go into the accounts later. By what was due from the Rizan estate, Prince Vasily meant several thousand rubles quit rent received from Pierre's peasants, which the prince had retained for himself. In Petersburg, as in Moscow, Pierre found the same atmosphere of gentleness and affection. He could not refuse the post, or rather the rank, for he did nothing, that Prince Vasily had procured for him, and acquaintances, invitations, and social occupations were so numerous that, even more than in Moscow, he felt the sense of bewilderment, bustle, and continual expectation of some good, always in front of him, but never attained. Of his former bachelor acquaintances, many were no longer in Petersburg. The guards had gone to the front, Dolgov had been reduced to the ranks, Anatoly was in the army somewhere in the provinces. Prince Andrew was abroad, so Pierre had not the opportunity to spend his nights as he used to like to spend them, or to open his mind by intimate talks with a friend older than himself and with whom he respected. His whole time was taken up with dinners and balls, and was spent chiefly at Prince Vasily's house in the company of the stout princess, his wife, and his beautiful daughter, Helene. Like the others, Anna Pavlovna's share showed Pierre the change of attitude toward him that had taken place in society. Formerly, in Anna Pavlovna's presence, Pierre had always felt that what he was saying was out of place, tactless, and unsuitable. 
that remarks which seemed to him clever while they were formed in his mind became foolish as soon as he uttered them, while on the contrary, Hippolyte's stupidest remarks came out clever and apt. Now, everything Pierre said was charmant. Even if Anna Pavlovna did not say so, he could see that she wished to and only refrained out of regard for his modesty. In the beginning of the winter of 1805 to 1806, Pierre received one of Anna Pavlovna's usual pink notes with an invitation to which was added, You will find the beautiful Helene here, whom is always delightful to see. When he read that sentence, Pierre felt for the first time that some link which other people recognized and had grown up between himself and Helene, and that thought both alarmed him, as if some obligation were being imposed on him, which he could not fulfill, and pleased him as an entertaining supposition. Anna Pavlovna's at home was like the former one, only the novelty she offered her guests this time was not Montmartre, but a diplomatist fresh from Berlin with the very latest details from the Emperor Alexander's visit to Postum, and of how the two August friends had pledged themselves in an indissolute alliance to uphold the cause of justice against the enemy of the human race. Anna Pavlovna received Pierre with a shade of melancholy, evidently relating to the young man's recent loss by the death of Count Bazukov. Everyone constantly considered it a duty to assure Pierre that he was greatly afflicted by the death of the father he had hardly known. And her melancholy was just like the august melancholy she showed at the mention of her most august majesty, the Empress Maria Fedorovna. Pierre felt flattered by this. Anna Pavlovna arranged the different groups in her drawing room with her habitual skill. The large group in which Prince Vasily and the generals and the, had the benefit of the diplomat. Another group was at the tea table. Pierre wished to join the former, but Anna Pavlovna who was in the excited condition of a commander on a battlefield to whom thousands of new and brilliant ideas occur, which there is hardly time to put into action, seeing Pierre, touched his sleeve with her finger, saying, Wait a bit, I have something in view for you this evening. She glanced at Helene and smiled at her. My dear Helene, be charitable to my poor aunt who adores you. Go and keep your company for ten minutes. And that, it will not be too dull, here is the dear Count who will not refuse to accompany you. The beauty went to the aunt. But Anna Pavlovna detained Pierre, looking as if she had to give some final necessary instructions. Isn't she exquisite, she said to Pierre, pointing to the stately beauty as she glided away, and how she carries herself. For so young a girl, such tact, such masterly perfection of manner, it comes from her heart. Happy the man who wins her. With her, the least worldly of men would occupy a most brilliant position in society. Don't you think so? I only wanted to know your opinion, said Anna Pavlovna and she let Pierre go. Pierre, in reply, sincerely agreed with her as to Helene's perfection of manner. If he ever thought of Helene, it was just of her beauty and her remarkable skill in appearing silently dignified in society. The old aunt received the two young people in her corner, but seemed desirous of hiding her adoration for Helene and inclined rather to show her fear of Anna Pavlovna. She looked at her niece, as if inquiring what she was to do with these people. On leaving them, Anna Pavlovna again touched Pierre's sleeve, saying, I hope you won't say that it is dull in my house again. And she glanced at Helene. Helene smiled, with a look implying that she did not admit the possibility of anyone seeing her without being enchanted. The aunt coughed, swallowed, and said in French that she was very pleased to see Helene. That she turned to Pierre with the same words of welcome and the same look. In the middle of a dull and halting conversation, Helene turned to Pierre with the beautiful bright smile that she gave to everyone. Pierre was so used to that smile, and it had so little meaning for him, that he paid no attention to it. The aunt was just speaking of a collection of snuff boxes that had belonged to Pierre's father, Count Pazukov, and showed them her own box. Princess Helene asked to see the portrait of the aunt's husband on the box lid. This is probably the work of Venice, said Pierre, mentioning the celebrated miniaturist, and he leaned over the table to take the snuff box while trying to hear what was being said at the other table. He half rose, meaning to go round. But the aunt handed him the snuff-box, passing it across Helene's back. Helene stooped forward to make room and looked around with a smile. She was, as always at evening parties, wearing a dress such as was then fashionable, cut very low at front and back. Her bust, which had always seemed like marble to Pierre, was so close to him that his short-sighted eyes could not but perceive the living charm of her neck and shoulders, so near to his lips that he need only have bent his head a little to have touched them. He was conscious of the warmth of her body, the scent of perfume, and the creaking of her corset as she moved. 
He did not see her marble beauty form a complete whole with her dress, but all the charm of her body only covered by her garments. And having once seen this, he could not help being aware of it, just as we cannot renew an illusion we have once seen through. So you have never noticed how before, how beautiful I am, Helene seemed to say. You had not noticed that I am a woman? Yes, I am a woman, who may belong to anyone, to you too, said her glance. And at that moment, Pierre felt that Helene not only could, but must be his wife, and that it could not be otherwise. He knew this at that moment as surely as if he had been standing at the altar with her. How and when this could be, he did not know. He did not even know if it would be a good thing. He even felt, he knew not why, that it would be a bad thing. But he knew that it would happen. Pierre dropped his eyes, lifted them again, and wished once more to see her as a distant beauty far removed from him, as he had seen her every day until then, but he could no longer do it. He could not, any more than a man who has been looking at a tuft of steep grass through the mist and taking it for a tree, can again take it for a tree after he has once recognized it to be a tuft of grass. She was terribly close to him. She already had power over him, and between them there was no longer any barrier except the barrier of his own will. Well, I will leave you in your little corner, came Anna Pavlovna's voice. I see you are all right here. And Pierre, anxiously, trying to remember whether he had done anything reprehensible, looked round with a blush. It seemed to him that everyone knew what had happened to him as he knew it himself. A little later, when he went up to the large circle, Anna Pavlovna said to him, I hear you are refitting your Petersburg house? This was true. The architect had told him that it was necessary, and Pierre, without knowing why, was having his enormous Petersburg house done up. That's a good thing. Don't move from Prince Vasily's. It's good to have a friend like the prince, she said, smiling at Prince Vasily. I know something about that, don't I? And you are still so young, you need advice. Don't be angry with me for exercising an old woman's privilege. She paused, as women always do, expecting something after they have mentioned their age. If you marry, it will be a different thing, she continued, uniting them both in one glance. Pierre did not look at Helene nor she at him. But she was just as terribly close to him. He muttered something and colored. When he got home, he could not sleep for a long time for thinking of what had happened. What had happened? Nothing. He had merely understood that the woman he had known of since being a child, of whom when her beauty was mentioned he had said absentmindedly, yes, she's good looking, he had understood that this woman might belong to him. But she's stupid. I have myself said that she is stupid, he thought. There's something nasty, something wrong in the feeling she excites in me. I've been told that her brother Anatoly was in love with her, and she with him, and there was quite a scandal, and that's why they, he was sent away. Hippolyte is her brother, Prince Vasily her father. Eh, it's bad, he reflected. But while he was thinking this, the reflection was still incomplete, he caught himself smiling and was conscious that another line of thought had sprung up, and while thinking of her worthlessness, he was also dreaming of how she would be his wife how she would love him and become quite different, and how all that he had thought and heard of her might be false. And he again saw her not as the daughter of Prince Vasily, but visualized her whole body only veiled by its gray dress. Ah, but no, why did this thought never occur to me before? And again he told himself that it was impossible, that there would be something unnatural, and as it seemed to him dishonorable in his marriage. He recalled her former words and looks, and the words and looks of those who had seen them together. He recalled Anna Pavlovna's words and looks when she spoke to him about his house, and recalled thousands of such hints from Prince Vasily and others, and was seized by terror lest he had already, in some way, bound himself to do something that was evidently wrong, and that he thought not to do, and what he ought not to do. But at the very time he was expressing this conviction to himself, in another part of his mind her image rose in all its womanly beauty. That concludes my reading of chapter 47. I'll follow it now with uh, my reflection on the same. A Year of War and Peace, Day 47, Plotting Gardens of Volcanic Earth. Meanwhile, on the home front, Pierre is involved in an entirely different type of war, a spiritual war. Though his body may be secure from French artillery shelling, his soul is under constant attack from the predations of a scheming and dishonest Russian high society, and the self-doubt and insecurity of his own psyche. The first salvos in this battle are launched by Prince Vasily. The battlefield is yet another party hosted by Anna Pavlovna. Prince Vasily lost his first campaign against Pierre, but that doesn't discourage the old man. He's got a young daughter in dire need of a rich man to marry. 
so there's no time to waste. His first move is to ingratiate himself with the newly wealthy Count Bazukov. This is easy enough. Pierre, after all, is one of the most marble-headed and muddled-thinking individuals this side of the Volga. For now, anyway. Vasily encounters no resistance whatsoever in establishing himself as Pierre's trusted confidant and financial advisor. He takes this opportunity to break himself off just a little piece of the Bazukov pie. But since his real goal is to pimp his daughter, he restrains his embezzlement just enough. Once he has Pierre's full confidence, Prince Vasily makes his move. He invites Pierre to Anna Pavlovna's party, where his beautiful daughter, Helene, will be waiting. Pierre doesn't stand a chance. Vasily pushes him towards Helene. Anna Pavlovna does too. Helene, bosom bared, gets into the game herself, working under the assumption, and a variation on a theme by Elizabeth Bennet, that rich men and stupid men are the only ones worth marrying. Pierre, on unexpectedly becoming Pelt, Count Bazukov and a rich man felt himself after his recent loneliness and freedom from cares so beset and preoccupied that only in bed was he able to be by himself. It may be hard for many of us to sympathize with the struggles of a rich man, but Tolstoy achieves this amazing feat of unwilling empathy in the character of Pierre Bazukov. Sure, Pierre is one of the richest men in all of Russia, but rich men are human too. In fact, he's all too human. In true Nietzschean fashion, laying out his garden plots of happiness too close to the sorrowful volcanic earths of the world. He yearns for human connection, and at this point in the novel anyway, seeks to access this comfort in the material and carnal delights of his newfound wealth. He suspects, for instance, that Helene is bad for him, but on the other hand, she's also super hot. In addition, the social respect his money has earned him is flattering. He's totally buying what Vasily is selling. Such things are the manacles that restrain us. Daily Meditation We are fettered by these bonds, the body I mean, and its possessions. Epictetus, The Discourses All right, that concludes my reading of chapter uh, 47 of War and Peace. Thanks for listening. Remember that if you'd like to support me, you can do so either by purchasing my ebook, A Year of War and Peace, becoming a patron at patreon.com, or making a one-time donation to PayPal. The links to all that are below. Tomorrow we'll be reading chapter 48 of War and Peace and reflecting on the same. I hope you'll join me then. Until then, take care of yourselves and of others.